right. I think I see just a few more of you joining, but we are going to go ahead and start off with some introductions we have here. As I said earlier, welcome again to the Advisex HPE Nutanix Weber Grill event. We're really excited to be doing this for everybody. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Steve Cooper here, our Vice President and General Manager of Advisex in the Northeast region. Here we go. Steve, go ahead and take it away. Okay, I'll just do a sound check. Am I good, Tori? You sound good to me. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Appreciate everybody's time this afternoon. Uh, so my name's Steve Hooker. I'm the VP and GM here at Advisix, and uh, I'm just really the MC this afternoon. So I'm going to run down a couple uh, housekeeping components here. We'd love to, after the presentations here, to get everybody on video, or even during the presentations, love to everybody turn turn their video camera on. Uh, also, I'm going to run down the agenda. I'm going to introduce a couple of our guest speakers here today, and I encourage everybody to be interactive, questions, what have you. We'll probably mute you during the presentation, but any questions and answers that we can run through, that would be outstanding. Uh, we're obviously going to run over the presentation, then go over to the grilling demo, and then stay tuned for the end for the prize raffle. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to announce the prize raffles, but I think it has something to do with the Weber grill and maybe a Weber grill toolkit. So uh, stay, stay on board for that to, through the entire presentations and the grilling demo. A uh, couple things here. Uh, first guest speaker or uh, co-guest speaker today will be Kyle Todd. He's in charge of strategic initiatives and the strategic initiative leader for North America for channels and ecosystem at HPE. Welcome, Todd. Then we have co-presenting with Todd, Karen, OEM sales manager, US North in Canada. So we look forward to both of them presenting and speaking about the HP and the Nutanix solution. And then we're gonna move on to Lauren and Klaus, the Weber grill chef, uh, for the move into the kitchen and start the grilling. And then last but not least, we'll be able to give some raffle prizes away. So, hey, just two minutes on Advisex, everyone here. Uh, we've been around for more than 45 years. We've been a leading technology provider across an infrastructure and enterprise applications and solutions. Some of you on this call may know us, but just a reminder, that's who Advisex is. We combine all of our expertise and our people with the innovative technologies and strategic business partners that we solve complex IT issues with for end users and the client business outcomes. Uh, we're guided by our mission for our customers for life. We consider ourselves architects of modernization, engineers of automation, and agents of business transformation. And that's a little bit of what you'll, you'll hear today as far as the HP Nutanix relationship. Right now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about grilling. So if you bear with me for two and a half minutes, I will bring up a grilling conversation, maybe involve some Weber grilling and also some technology. So stay with me here. <clears throat> um, we all know during COVID, we've probably been grilling out on the deck, grilling indoors, grilling outdoors, whatever that may be. But uh, during my barbecue season, there is an etiquette that I follow when it comes to the dangerous task of outdoor cooking. It's the only type of cooking as a real man, such as I am, that I step into and take control of. It is called grill or deck cooking for me. But I've taken steps to help me diminish the fear and the danger of grilling by enabling my Weber Connect Smart Grilling Hub and application. Oh, by the way, you can buy that from Weber Grill, not from HPE, Nutanix, or Advisix. Uh, I think that's all stored on the HPE Nutanix cloud solutions though. So FYI, if you wanna download that, you'll use HPE Nutanix in the back end. So when I volunteer for this barbecue and on my Weber grill, the following chain of events occur. My wife buys the food. My wife makes the salad, prepares the vegetables and makes the desserts. My wife prepares the meat for the cooking, places it on a tray, along with all of my necessary cooking utensils from Weber, all the sauces, and it takes me some time as I'm lounging around, grilling on the deck with a beer in my hand, being able to manage everything from the app. Here comes the most important part. I place the meat on the grill, not my wife. My wife then goes inside to organize the plates and the table settings. 
My wife comes out to tell me that the meat is burning. I thank her for that. And I ask if she will bring me another beer while I deal with the situation. That situation is all while monitoring my Weber grill app. It's very simple for me to lounge and monitor on my app. So then my wife goes in and prepares the plates, the salads, the vegetables, the bread, the utensils, I don't know, the napkins, the sausages, and she puts them all on the table. Real important piece here, listen to me closely. I put my beer down, I put my cell phone down with my Weber app, and I take the meat off the grill. Then I hand it to my wife. After eating, my wife clears the table. She does the dishes. And she only does this not because I'm the real man of grilling, but because I'm in IT and I have to monitor my emails 24 by 7, such of all of us on the phone. So most important of all, everyone in my family praises me for a fabulous cooking job and fabulous cooking on the grill and all my efforts. I then, and this will be my final note, I then asked my wife, how did she enjoy her night off from cooking? <laughs> Upon seeing the annoyance on her face and the reaction, it concludes there's no pleasing my wife. The end. So I hope we can please all of you during our social gathering here this afternoon. Whether it's an on-prem, cloud solution, or whether it's a hybrid cloud solution, whether the technology is only successful and efficient, and it supports your business needs, both now and in the future. Our Advisex Adaptive Infrastructure helps IT departments continually modernize infrastructure to take full advantage of innovative features so organizations such as yours can be more agile, efficient, and productive. I'm gonna leave you a couple acronyms here. Maybe you can ask questions about these later, who knows, to win raffle prizes. HCI, CAS, consumption as a service, cloud, many different types of clouds, AI, agility, all-in-one solutions. Then I'm gonna leave you a little bit of math. One plus one plus one equals one. Hmm, Kook's not that smart of a guy, but here's what I'm here to tell you. Best of breed conversation equals one solution to solidify your IT operations from Advisix, HPE, and Nutanix. So from here, I hope I didn't go over my two and a half minutes. I did. Uh, I looked at. I just looked at my watch. But I thank all of you for joining. I'm going to turn this over to Kyle. Thank you very much. <laughs> That, that is the most unique opening I've ever heard, Mr. Cooker. Thank you very much. And, and you know, there's a similarity between the way you run Advisix and, and the cooking, which is that when there's a job to be done, you put the smartest people in the world on site for the organization and they get the job done. So you bring in the subject matter experts. It's not dissimilar from the whole cooking arrangement. So um, Steve's the first guy that I ever met when I joined HPE 10 years ago, and I've seen the organization he runs, and it is the best of the best and incredibly bright, talented people that really do look for customers for life. It's not about a transaction. It's, it's about how can we take care of you and help you move to the next phase of, of technology and make you competitive and all that so, so that uh, you can be successful. So nothing but good things to say about Advisix and, and Mr. Cooker, um, all barbecuing stories aside. So what I'm going to talk about is, is the power of it's one and one in this case and one with Advisix. What we're doing with Nutanix, which is one of the most exciting things that I've seen in years. And so I'm joined by Carrie, and I'm going to co-present with, with Karen. I'm going to co-present with her and turn things over, and we'll go back and forth a little bit. And what I want to talk about are the issues that we've seen over and over again come up with our customers and our clients. And these, these are making HCI more relevant today than they ever were in the past. So there's five major things I want to highlight. The first is preserving capital. Every organization that we're dealing with is saying we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last and to make sure that we get through this in a good state of health we want to do all we can to preserve capital. Karen's going to talk about ways that Nutanix does that that are really compelling. 
Second thing is the need to reduce TCO, which is kind of part of the whole preserve capital equation because no one knows what their ongoing budget's going to be. So anything you can do today to reduce overall spend is a good thing. Simplifying management is critical for a couple of reasons. A lot of data centers are being managed remotely. And so if you can't, if you have to go into a data center to conduct operations, that's a problem. But the second thing is an even bigger issue. And it's something we've heard um, organizations talk about for a long time, which is we've got these incredibly qualified IT professionals that spend a lot of their time doing low level stuff that frankly is beneath them. You take brilliant technologists and you say, great, go make sure your Windows Server 2019 patches have all been uploaded. Make sure there's a firmware patch that's been done. That doesn't help the business. And so simplifying management means taking a lot of the low level stuff and automating it. And again, Karen is gonna to speak to that. Improve agility. I think everybody figured out with the advent of the pandemic that in the future, we're not going to have months and years to plan for things. We have to respond in real time. And the, the enablement that Nutanix provides is, is key there. And that's where Advisex plays a big role as well because of this consulting staff that I was talking about in the past, their ability to look at what your objectives are and then figure out how to get you there. And then the last thing is secure and protect. And I was recently on a webinar with James Morrison, who is at HPE today, but spent 20 plus years at the FBI for cybersecurity. James gave me a, a fact that I'm not familiar with in the past. and It's terrifying. What we have tracked is that a lot of drug cartels are now getting into cybercrime because it's safer and more lucrative than the drug trade. So if, if that's how big a market cybercrime is, this is something to be concerned about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how HPE addresses security and, and Nutanix from an application standpoint is great as well. So when you look at all these problems and just take another glance at them, if you look at that, the first, the knee jerk response might be, well, I'll just go to the cloud because I won't have to buy stuff up front. I'll pay for it as I use it. Management, well, the cloud takes care of that. I'm going to be agile because I can just start new applications in real time, and I'm sure it's, it's safe, so I, I'm okay there. So what Nutanix and HPE, our message is that we absolutely believe that the cloud is the answer, but the reality is that the cloud isn't a location, it's an approach to IT, because what you wanna do is, is to have infrastructure that scales infinitely and simply. You want to have everything as a service. If you need capacity, you want it in real time. You want it self-managing. You don't want to be the person running around going, did we upgrade Windows Server recently? And the last thing, and, and Steve brought this up in one of his acronyms, is you want consumption-based pricing. So you don't want to pay for it up front if you can avoid it. You want to monitor your usage and pay for it on a monthly basis. So Nutanix does an amazing job at this. That's why Gartner names them number one for HCI software year after year after year. And Karen, I'll flip the slides for you, but I wonder if you could chime in and, and talk about the details about how Nutanix does all of this. Sure can. Thanks, Kyle. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. So happy to have you. So for those of you who haven't heard about Nutanix, Kyle, if you want to go back one slide, what we really do is we help our customers modernize their data center and run their applications at any scale on-prem or in the cloud. Our as-a-service cloud-like model enables complete flexibility to scale, consume, and manage your infrastructure based on your needs. With HPE, we offer the added benefit of a consumption-based model with Greenlight, giving you complete operational flexibility like never before. With so many options for on-prem and cloud, our infrastructure as a service model allows you to take advantage of all the benefits of cloud with our joint DX offering. You get the industry's most trusted platform, HP, plus the unlimited ability to scale as you grow, all managed from a single pane of glass, end-to-end -end from any device, anywhere, anytime. Next slide. When you look at automation, it's so key today as the speed of our business increases. The ability to automate your operations and accelerate delivery of applications to the business helps increase productivity while lowering your costs. 
The ability to proactively understand your growth and business needs reduces the potential of overruns and additional costs while giving you the advantage to plan for your growth like never before. The self-healing and proactive management automated through our software analytics helps to eliminate mundane day-to-day -day tasks, allowing your IT resources to work on more strategic offerings to deliver to your business while lowering those costs all at the same time. And with all the goodness that you've seen, you get a true cloud-like experience and all the benefits while still maintaining and controlling your costs. What's interesting is recently we announced in early September, we now offer general availability of Nutanix clusters on AWS. Azure is coming shortly. For you, this means we now extend all the Nutanix benefits to the public cloud by eliminating complexities and costs of hybrid environments. We now enable seamless mobility across private and public clouds without having to re-architect any of your applications. This gives you complete flexibility to choose the right cloud environment for the right application with the added benefit of license portability across multiple clouds. I invite you to test drive this or any Nutanix offering for 30 days with our test drive promotion. And for our existing customers who enjoy the benefits of Nutanix today on DX, they can also access a single node for free through their Nutanix portal immediately to experience Nutanix clusters. So in closing, we have never had a faster growing OEM partnership than we have experienced with HP in the last 11 months. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Kyle to tell you what's so unique about our joint success. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you, Karen. And, and so I can brag about Nutanix shamelessly, whereas Karen has to be at least somewhat modest. But one thing that I wanna highlight is the efficiency element. And so I've, I've been involved in system sales for a long, long time. And, and one of the things that we're aware of is that a lot of customers over provision their environments. And so they look at compute, they look at storage, they look at networking. And because there's spike times or peak times throughout the month, they'll have to over provision all three of those, which means that they end up spending money that they maybe could have saved. What's amazing about Nutanix is the ability to take a look at performance and resources and blend them perfectly. So that if, if you need additional compute at a certain time of the month or for a certain application, you transfer that capability or that resource to that application. When it's no longer needed, you reassign it. Nutanix does this constantly. And so because of that, they can document the savings that customers have by avoiding over-provisioning their hardware. So when you, when you look at the success that we've had, you know, one of the top two retailers in the world, one of the top two aerospace, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's because these customers are realizing that the combination of this software, which automates the environment so beautifully on top of a platform like HPE is a great combination. So I'm going to talk about several of the attributes that I think bring extra value with HPE. The first thing is we've got the broadest portfolio for any vendor in the Nutanix environment. We currently have 14 different platforms. And the benefit of that is you're, you're, you're going to be able to size exactly the right system for the workload. Because when you sit down with Advisex and, and they say, are you doing VDI? Are you doing big data? SAP, HANA, et cetera, their engineers are gonna work with you to figure out for that specific workload, let's use the platform over here. For the next workload, now that looks like a DX4200. So the fact that they've got such a broad palette of options helps them find exactly the right configuration for what you're trying to do. But probably the biggest thing we've got in favor of HPE is security. And the, the terrifying statistic, aside from the drug cartel getting into this, is that every 11 seconds, an organization is going to be a victim of ransomware. And it's expensive. It can be embarrassing. Customers and companies and organizations can lose credibility when their data is stolen. There was a terrible incident in Germany a few weeks ago where the patient was actually lost because that hospital's data had been taken ransom. So being able to protect the system through, through incredible resilient firmware 
that guards you against somebody inserting malware and, and taking control of the system, there's a huge benefit. And, and I could go into technical details forever about this stuff, but probably the best proof point is the Marsh Cyber Catalyst Program. So what Marsh did, and if you're not familiar, they're a giant in the insurance industry. What Marsh did was they, working with cyber insurance, said, are there certain platforms that provide better protection against data theft? Because just like if you have a car alarm system or a home alarm system, you get better insurance rates. Same is true for cyber insurance. If you're using infrastructure, that does a better job of protecting your environment, you should be eligible for better terms. Well, Marsh looked at the whole industry and, and they picked just a handful of products that provide this great protection. The only volume server platform they picked is Proliant from HPE. So when you deploy Nutanix software on an HPE Proliant DX system, you're getting the best protection in the industry and you're eligible for better terms with, uh, with cyber insurance as a result of it. The second thing is AI and predictive analytics. And I, I talked a little bit about how Nutanix does you know, with machine learning and is able to predict where resources are needed and then in real time transfer those resources to whichever application needs them, which is a fantastic way to run an efficient data center. HPE does the same thing with system availability and, and reliability. So every 10 minutes, we have a product called InfoSight, and every 10 minutes it does a health check of the system. And it looks for indications that something could go wrong down the road. So it's not that something's already in the red zone and, and people are being called in the middle of the night. It's looking at something saying that combination of that operating system and that firmware and that application and that particular disk drive, we've got telemetry from systems all over the world that indicate when, when those error messages all align, that means something's going to fail in two weeks. So proactively, let's order a new memory unit. Let's order a new disk drive. Let's replace a CPU. So the fact that this is able to predict when things will go wrong and take proactive action to keep those systems from ever going offline if possible, that's a huge win. And again, it lets IT professionals work on the mission critical stuff and not looking at error messages from disk drives to try and figure out what's going wrong. And then the third thing is consumption-based pricing for the whole infrastructure and the software. So we have an offering called GreenLake. And what we do is Advisix and Nutanix and HPE sit down with you on day one, and we look at your three-year projection of IT resources. Look at what the growth of the environment is gonna look like. And day one, we install all of that infrastructure on your data center floor. But you don't pay for it day one. All you do is pay on a monthly basis what you actually consume. So the good news is when you do have those spikes of growth or you, you need to in, increase your infrastructure footprint, it's already sitting there on the data center floor. You're just not paying for it. And if you have an emergency situation where suddenly something outlandish like everyone has to suddenly work from home, like that would happen. But if that ever happened, well, you've got the resources there to turn on in real time. This results in a 65% reduction in the time it takes to deploy a solution, and it reduces over-provisioning by 30%. So it's a huge, huge benefit from a cost standpoint and from a simplicity standpoint. Another thing I should point out is Nutanix and HPE are so committed to this partnership that we've, well, one proof point is we've got 14 certified platforms that we've done together. But another thing is the fact that today with the lifecycle management tool from Nutanix, you can actually update, update all your, your firmware on these HPE systems. So take a look at the list on the left with one click from a Nutanix screen, not an HPE screen, from a Nutanix screen, you can update all of that firmware. So again, your IT staff isn't busy doing low level things like updating ILO firmware. It's all gonna be done automatically for you. So the benefit is if you look at what Karen was talking about and, and what I've tried to cover is you've got the number one HCI software pick from Gartner year after year after year. You've got the industry's leading platform and if you look at the five business challenges, how do we preserve capital? How do we reduce TCO? How can we simplify 
management to have a more efficient environment? How can we be much more agile, start new applications, you know, in minutes instead of weeks, add new users instantly? How can we secure that environment? You don't have to go to an, a public cloud for all of that. There's a great place for the public cloud in everybody's environment, and you can now manage it with Nutanix. But the point is, the cloud is, a, is an approach to computing, not a location. And for cost benefits and a lot of other benefits, running it on-prem with Nutanix on HPE is, is a great approach. And Advisix is a, is a wonderful consulting organization that in addition to providing infrastructure, can sit down with you up front and figure out the plan of how to get you there. So that's all for us. That's, that's on the, the, the product education um, overview. And I'm gonna turn it over to the fun stuff. Turn it over to Lauren and to Chef Klaus to take it from here. Thank you very much. Hi, that's us. That's us. Hi, guys. <laughs> that was a great introduction, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, we might have to have somebody pin the video for us. I think that's usually what works best. Uh, I don't think I can do that from my phone. I might be able to do that. Well, or everyone's else muted, so we're fine. We're the ones showing on the screen. That's all that matters. Yeah, I pinned you. You should be good now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and flip our camera around. All right, Chef Klaus. Oh, there's all kinds of pay. All right, so um, if anybody wants, so welcome to Weber Grill. We're glad to have you guys joining us today. This is Chef Klaus Lauder. He's our Grill Academy chef, um, and he's going to teach us today how to grill your bone-in ribeye, as well as um, some of our delicious shrimp. Um, everyone should receive them in your kits, and um, we're talking about the best tips and practices with all of the grilling. Um, if you haven't already, the first thing we need to ask you to do, I know I'm like, I'm, the camera's on you and I'm talking, but whatever. <laughs> um, to take your steaks out of the refrigerator if you're going to be grilling along with us. Um, or if you're going to be grilling in just a little bit, you might want to start setting those aside. Um, usually, and I'll let you talk about why. Um, and then second, um, if you have any questions throughout the entire group process, just type them into the Q&A, and then um, I'll be able to read those out to Chef Klaus as we're going along. We encourage you to ask any kind of questions about grilling that you would like, whether it's about the specific stuff that we're talking about today, um, or grilling in general. Um, you know, we've got a nice chunk of time here, so it's your opportunity to ask this grilling expert what the, what the best stuff is. So Klaus, why don't you go ahead and take it from there? All right. Uh, welcome folks. Uh, as Lawrence mentioned, I'm Chef Klaus. I've been with Weber Grill now since 2016. Uh, I've been taking over the Grill Academy Chef since the uh, last couple of years. And it's, it's our pleasure to be uh, joining uh, your meeting and uh, sharing these tips and tricks and talking about these steaks and shrimp with you. Uh, usually as we start off during the class, uh, we know there's a good mix about uh, gas grillers and charcoal grillers out there. Uh, how many do we have again in this uh, meeting, Lauren? I think we have like over 40, I believe. Yeah, so quite a good quite a good chunk. So we're not going to go through the majority of it and ask everybody <laughs> exactly what it is to grill on. Um, but we are going to talk about uh, both gas grilling and charcoal grilling as we do in most of our classes. And the first thing we got to do, of course, is we're going to have to light our grills. And uh, let's talk about that. So awesome. uh, here at the uh, demo kitchen here inside Schaumburg, uh, well, a Weber Grill restaurant. Schaumburg, Illinois. Because these guys are all over there. Okay. In Illinois. All right. <laughs> So uh, what we have here is a Weber Genesis 2, and it is a uh, three burner. And uh, we're talking about gas grills. A lot of them are gonna be very similar to that nature. The first tip is uh, for lighting up your gas grill, of course, it's gonna be to lift the lid, right? You do not wanna let that cavity build up with gas and uh, end your grilling experience really quick. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are still several out there who uh, go the opposite. Oh boy, yeah. that's scary. So once so your lift propane, the lid, got it. <laughs> once the propane is on, um, or your natural gas line. Uh, usually you have uh, all burners here you want to kind of bring it towards the point where it has a little insignia here for lighting. Let the gas go in and then you want to go ahead and spark it up from there and that'll get your gas going. And then from there we're going to leave the, uh, uh, in this particular grill, this setup, we're going to leave the middle one off completely and we're going to have the left, the right side as well as medium high. And that sets the acronym for what we're really called uh, MOM, which is going to medium high off medium high. What that does is that establishes our cooking grill zones. You'll hear us talking about it all throughout the class. 
can do direct grilling, which can be right over the main heat, the burners or the charcoal. Uh, indirect grilling, which can be your cool zone if you, uh, over the burners that are off or the space where there is no charcoal. And then again, surrounding it with the, uh, the other side here with the direct grilling. So once you have that lid, we're gonna go ahead and close the grill. And it should take you approximately about 10 to 15 minutes, really gets your maximum heat uh, according to whatever burners you have lit. And what that main temperature we want to look for is around 450 to 500 degrees. So it's kind of like your sweet spot. Now, Chef Klaus, we know that not everyone has this big fancy grill that you have here mm -hmm. at home. So they might only have a two burner grill. Well, how would we handle that with direct and indirect if we only had a two burner grill or if the, the grates were horizontal and not vertical? So if you have the horizontal grills for one, then you usually do is I set the back burners on and I'll leave the front burner off. And that way you set your uh, directly in the back and direct in the front. Uh, two burners as well, too. You would actually just have one on and the other one possibly on low. Um, the point is that uh, whatever it takes to, to, to get that, that level of temperature right there between the 450 to 500 range. Um, as far as sort of talking about charcoal grills, um, which uh, I am more of an advocate or just my, my personal preference is more on charcoal just because of the flavor uh, component here. But we, uh, we're gonna, we are going to plug some more Weber products, even though Steve, right. uh, thankfully, you're ready to talk about the new Weber Connect Cup. Yes, we, we appreciate that. We do, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, we, we use this chimney uh, for lighting up our charcoal. And what we tend to plan to do is we fill up the cavity uh, roughly about uh, two inches from the top. And this will give us plenty of uh, charcoal and fuel to cook for at least an hour and a half. And um, you can see that we place it right back down onto the bottom charcoal grate. And to light up underneath that, we use this white paraffin uh, wax cubes, also lighter cubes, Don, um, to go ahead and light it up. Now, this is a perfect opportunity to, to promote the fact that uh, you want to use something anyway that's not going to uh, offer the flavor of your grilling experience, whatever it is you have up on the grill. <laughs> no lighter fluid. Yeah. <laughs> actually say we, we, we don't really have to use of uh, lighter fluid, uh, gasoline, uh, anything that's flammable otherwise outside of these cubes. Uh, they're odorless, they're tasteless, and they're pretty much waterproof. They're great for, uh, for your grills, they're great for camping, uh, great for your fire pits out back. Yes. Uh, what would burners would you recommend for a six burner summit? Eric's got a big fancy grill. Mm -hmm. And then um, is there a case, oh, um, I think I saw somebody say something about, is it okay to be using newspaper if you don't have those? Uh, going to the uh, to the summit, yeah, absolutely. You can do the same setup that we're just talking about right now, or you can use that sear, uh, that sear burner setup you have also in the center of your uh, summit grill. Uh, you can turn that center part on there and you could actually go the, um, the one before, the sear grate, the one after it, and then you keep the two off on the side. Uh, that grill sparks are pretty high, the PTU is very strong. Uh, you should be good with that. As far as we use a lot of newspaper or cardboard as well, um, it does work. You have to keep on replacing it um, as it burns out pretty fast, and those ashes tend to fly around pretty uh, pretty good. Uh, there are also like these little uh, uh, brick uh, uh, campfire starters as well too, kind of like this compressed stuff. They work pretty decently as well. Gotta be louder. So you should go from there. So a couple notes that I gotta be a little bit louder. So I will have to use my Expo Chef projecting uh, voice. No worries. Okay, um, so once you have your charcoal uh, lit, uh, for example, you're gonna have the heavy smoke uh, uh, coming off the top of it. What that is, that's burning off the, uh, the carbon. And what you wanna do, it takes about 15, 20 minutes for the heavy smoke to dissipate, and you're gonna have uh, like this really, uh, just, just clear heat coming off it, the flames gonna be building out of the top of it. You're gonna see charcoal, it's gonna be black with gray tips. That's totally fine. You don't wanna wait until it's sprayed and ashed over, you lost half your cook time. And at that point, that's when you want to uh, dump your charcoal and establish your uh, your cook zones actually in the uh, charcoal grill. So with this uh, with this extra handy uh, little handle, um, you can help it kind of navigate uh, the charcoal basket because it's going to be a little heavier while charcoal in. So make sure when you're doing it, come at a nice angle. Why do you keep walking away from me? They can't hear you. Yeah, but <laughs> you got to project this here, right? So you can be dumping the charcoal uh, right into the grill itself. And uh, you can use the charcoal baskets that actually come with a lot of the kettle grills these days. And you can establish the same type of setup here. We have baskets, one on one side, one on the other, and your center is gonna be uh, completely off. Or you can put those baskets together or pyramid style and just put it right there in the center. That's gonna be your uh, uh, bullseye setup. So the outer ring is gonna be indirect. Or you can just do the traditional and just uh, 
uh, create a, a pyramid in the back of the grill and have your uh, direct uh, in the front and your direct in the back of it. Okay, so I don't put charcoal all over the whole box. Absolutely not. And if you tell me you have an experience of done it yourself or seen somebody else here do it, I know there's some liars out there because <laughs> it has happened. I mean, back in the day, you know, before I'm getting into the serious grilling of it, I'm sure I know I've done it myself. <laughs> All right, you do not need to have all our burners on the gas grill completely on high. You do not need to have a complete diameter or circumference filled up of the um, of the charcoal grill loaded with charcoal as well too, because all that is going to do is just going to be hot, 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 and you're going to have flare-ups left and right, and you might have a steak that's going to end up being more, looking more like charcoal uh, rather than a beautiful piece of meat that you just paid a lot of money for. Yeah, I'm, I'm baking on some Instagram-looking steaks today, so. Yeah. Yeah, so you're going to teach us how to do, right? Absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is beautiful. It is art, right? It is. It's not a science. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and, you know, speaking of which, not a science is that you know you're going to be grilling outdoors, not like this indoor kitchen we have here. So you also have to go bat a little bit with the uh, the elements, uh, the wind as well too. I know we have a lot of people on Pittsburgh. You know, I don't know how the how the breeze and the wind is coming off three rivers over there, but uh, for sure, it's uh, it can definitely affect how your grill is going to react that day as well too, despite doing the normal procedure that you always do. So uh, make sure you know that and you play around with it as well. Uh, uh, Chef Plus, what temperature are we trying to get our, gr our uh, grills to again? Uh, about as 450 to 500. That's what we're preheating it to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, don't necessarily actually need to even have your, you know, like all, gr all uh, grill burners on to get to the preheat level. Just give it, a, just give it 10, 15 minutes. It'll be fine. It should get there. I mean, we're, we're back up onto it. And um, it's only been a few minutes. Well, it's been a few minutes since we had it open last, which True. we lost about 150 degrees on the internal uh, temperature as well. So uh, doing that, we're going to go ahead and move on over to our steaks Woo! and uh, to the proteins we have in front of you. Um, so what you have for you all is a, a beautiful 22-ounce uh, uh, bone and ribeye. This is actually one of my favorite cuts of meat. The reason why I have a towel below it is because uh, your steak, as well as mine, were cryovats, which means they were sealed airtight and they're tenderized in their own juices. So what we had done is we removed that packaging, uh, we, we patted it dry, and set the towel aside, and that's gonna be best for uh, for applying the, uh, the oil and the seasoning so it's not gonna be just running off. So we're talking about aging. Sorry, Peter asked the question, what does this apply to WSM regarding pyramid charcoal placement? I assume not, I don't know what S, W. That, that's the uh, Weber Smoky Mountain. Oh, see, look at that. Knowing the acronyms, then I don't even know what they are. Well, it's, it's, it's all part of the gig. Yeah, so <laughs> as, as far as the, the, the Smoky Mountain smoker um, that, that Weber has out there, um, it's you, you, difficult to reach that type of temperature unless you're going to be, um, for one, you're going to be removing your, uh, removing that water pan. So you can actually still do some, uh, some grilling on there. Because otherwise your temperature range is going to be right around 250 to 350 maximum um, if you set up like a normal smoker. So you can't really have that much of a uh, similarity in, uh, in uh, creating your zone cooking on a Smoky Mountain smoker than it would be like on a normal uh, charcoal grill, whether it's the kettle, the uh, uh, the summit charcoal, or the performer. Okay. Yeah, you can do it on there. You can grill on there, no problem. Like I said, you're gonna have to remove that water pan. And then when you set your charcoal down below it, you could, you could actually just try to range it, maybe just on one side, because your max circumference on that, or the max diameter is 18 inch in comparison to the uh, uh, 22 inch like on the other kettles right now. He has removed the water pan to get it, get it more like a charcoal grill. See, Peter knows what's going on. Well, I'm sure he's done it already before, too. <laughs> so let's talk about these beautiful steaks you have in front yes. of you, right? So, you know, as we talked before about the, uh, um, the ribeye steaks, this is going to be your fattiest piece of, of like traditional steak that's going to be on the market, right? If you're, you're looking for something that's lean, uh, you know, lean and mean, that's going to be uh, talking about the, the tenderloin, the, the filet mignon, uh, Regal New York strip that's got some more marbleization, has a fat cap across the top of it. But the ribeye, the thing about the ribeye, uh, we have all this, uh, this fat separating the muscles here in between it that comes right off the ribs, obviously. This is off a, a subprimal cut, which is called the rib loin. And also, AKA, transforms into something that we all know and, and we love, and that's the roast prime rib. The reason why that is so sought after is because of the fat content that's in there. Remember, um, Laura, we talked about it a few more times. Fat is what? Flavor! Fat is what? 
flavor. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's that's what we wanted to do is uh, when we're grilling ribeye steaks, I don't want to go anything less than 16 ounce. Those the ribeye steaks, you can't render that fat down in the time frame that you're gonna, you know, you end up overcooking the rest of your meat. So so typically when we have anything 16 ounce or above. Uh, we want to get our, our, our char, uh, sear marks on it so, uh, as quick as possible and let it finish off indirect. So we can actually get some of this fat to be nice and soft and let it render down and spread all throughout. Um, we're talking about steaks as well too. We like to talk about grading and it's kind of separate what it is, what the difference is between the different grades out there. Uh, starting kind of at the base is going to be select. Select is going to be uh, a lot less marbleization on to. It's going to be one of your more affordable cuts or grades that could be out on the market. Then you go into choice. Price jumps up, marbleization increases. That's all this here in between it. That's all the nice marbling you see the fat going throughout. And then you're going to go to uh, certified Angus beef. It's actually still part of choice, but it's the upper third uh, part of choice, which is typically traditionally what we have here at the restaurant. So we got 10% uh, less marbleization than prime steaks. And the prime is really going to be paying the money for. Uh, and included that would be Kobe and Wagyu. Um, it's not always typically. Uh, based on you know what type of steer it is, but it, it's a it's a it's a combination of all sorts of uh, uh, different components to actually help get to that type of quality meat, and that's going to be a dietary, uh, it's going to be a region, it's going to be um, uh, just, just the care of the animals, uh, uh, and, and really what comes up, what's the outcome of it. Like if you have grass fed as well, too. Grass fed is typically also kind of more insecticide. It's it's an all natural type product that's out there, and it's really red really rich in iron because of all the grass fed that's being done rather than some of the grain fed that's out there. So there's a there's a little coverage right there about the different grades. If there's any questions you go and let me know. I, um, I think that's good. No. Yeah. So right. if you're at the supermarket, what is something that you you want to avoid, you know, or the butcher and you're like, you know, that steak's on sale, should I buy it? Like what are some things that you don't want to see in your steak? Well, the first, uh, the, the first ones are going to be all about sight. You know, you want to take a look to see what your steaks are on. So check out the expiration date that's on there. Um, know that if you're going to be uh, getting something that says it's going to be expiring that day uh, before you, you freeze or use it, um, then you, you, you do want to use it then right away because you, you're going to end up uh, uh, freezing it. And then by the time it thaws out as well, too, it's going to lose a lot of its quality. Because uh, every time you do freeze uh, any protein, what happens is those uh, uh, the, the water molecules all inside inside the uh, protein, they actually uh, they end up exploding inside of it, and then and when you when you thaw it out again, you just notice all this moisture loss on it. So you tend to have a drier product. Um, so that's your first visual. Uh, obviously, no 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 greenish or gray uh, color whatsoever. Stay away. Um, and uh, also, we want to look at is uh, see if there's any vein or 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 other uh, collagen that's going to be running throughout your product. You'll see a lot of times meteor strips as you get further down to the uh, to the butt side of it, there's going to be uh, uh, this main end section of it, which is probably like the last third of the the rib loin or the yeah the rib loin itself. You want to uh, avoid any vein veins that's going through here because that vein is not going to be able to break down in the cooking process. Got it. Typically you should cut around that and I use that for skewers. Uh, uh, a pan sear for quick sear as well too, uh, something along those lines. That's, that's something things uh, to really avoid when you're looking at the market. I mean, you're gonna go out, you're gonna see, uh, you see a lot of types of steaks are gonna kind of mask what they are and make it look like fillets. Uh, you get that with sirloin a lot of times and some butt steaks, um, but that those meats are typically known for better for braising than they are for having for quick cooking because they're they're they're, they're the structure. Fiber structure of the protein is not, not meant to be tender. Um, so it lends itself to be a little tougher steak. Adam wants to know Would you recommend a reverse sear for a ribeye? Actually, great question. And um, I do recommend it. Um, I am typically more of the, uh, the, the direct sear um, method first over the indirect or the reverse sear. But for, in, for this case, you could definitely try it out here. I mean, um, if you don't want to try with this one, you're trying to try it uh, a separate time. Match them up to yourself the, the way it is. And for those of you that are wondering what a reverse sear is, is that basically instead of the traditional oh, practice. To this. Oh, yeah, this is going to be oh, my. Nice. <laughs> so the traditional practice is that you put it on the grill and you sear the outside of the steak to lock in all of the juices and move it to an indirect to continue cooking throughout the inside of the steak. 
For Revere's first theory, you actually use lower temperature and you get um, cooked to a lower temperature and then you sear it on the outside at the end, uh, which then means that the steak is from top to bottom, maybe a little bit more of that color that you're looking for. Fantastic. Somebody's been paying attention. Yes, I learned something. Yeah, the reverse sear <laughs> is just uh, is, is meant to, uh, to get more universal color than throughout it. And by doing this way, you're spending less time in the direct heat. So you're allowing that steak to kind of to, to heat up slowly. And you bring it to about 100 degrees internal temperature, which is still rare, uh, very rare. And um, then you finish it off by uh, either adding more charcoal, getting, getting a sparky really hot, or turning up your grill after you pulled it off to, to get it really hot as well too, just get the hard sear on it. And then you're closing off your pores then. Sounds great. Um, the uh, As far as the, the shrimp products, uh, the shrimp that we have there, where you here in the, in the restaurant, I believe you have received this well too, are these uh, Texas Gulf shrimp. Now, uh, one of the reasons why we, we choose to go for the, the Texas Gulf shrimp, this is 1620 size, which means it's approximately 16 to 20 per pound, somewhere in that range. And uh, you can see that at the stores, they'll actually have the label usually on the packages as well. Uh, the Texas skull shrimp, what you're doing is getting something more domestic. It's right in the Gulf there with the warm waters. And it's uh, it's usually wild caught. Wild caught is going to be a little bit better for you, I think, than than the, than the farm raised shrimp uh, because this is a, a raised in its national environment. Nothing's taken away from it. It gets the full nutrients, full spectrum, what makes the shrimp so delicious. And um, that, that's, that's what we choose here. Now, this is, you guys have received a pound of it. Uh, so we're just going to show you how to do and put it up on the skewer. Now, as far as cleaning the shrimp, which is not not always the the, the best uh, uh, best or most sought after type of work, but anyway, it needs to be done. Uh, you're going to save yourself a lot of money if you get the uh, the shrimp to peel yourself. So uh, imagine the shell completely on it. I uh, should take scissors and go right between the shell and the flesh and cut myself all the way down, cut the shrimp all the way down to the last segment. And that way it makes it really easy to kind of pull the uh, the rest of the shrimp off it unless you clean the dietary tract that's right in the middle of it now some are going to be a little cleaner than others some be a little dirtier than others you know <laughs> just kind of rinse it off um uh, put them in the garbage and you'd be ready to go um my go-to marinade for shrimp uh, as well as vegetables is just highly recommended is, is doing an herb garlic blend um which is essentially uh vegetable oil 75 percent 25 percent olive oil and then you can use raw garlic rosemary parsley and either thyme or oregano. Now, you don't have to chop it ahead of time. Just pull the leaves off the stems, pick the raw garlic, throw that in there with the oil in your food processor, use it in your blender. You can do it in your um, uh, the hand the hand mixer uh, uh, blender as well too. You just puree the hell out of it so it gets nice and uh, chopped up and it's uh, well incorporated. Now you can use that marinade for your, for your shrimp, for chicken, for steaks even, uh, pork as well, and vegetables. So I highly recommend it. Now. Typically, how we do is I'll, I'll, I'll add like four shrimp or three shrimp and two skewers, and then they got a little math issue, but it's not. It's meant to be that way. So in your packs, we didn't include the skewers, but you can get them um, pretty much at any local any grocery, grocery, yeah, grocery, grocery store. Yeah. Uh, what's really important about the skewers, Chef Klaus, that we need to make sure everybody knows? You got to soak them. Soak them, yes. So if you're not using metal, you're using wood, anytime you use wood, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious, but we'll just state it anyway. You want to soak your wood. Uh, with planks, your wood skewers, and water. Um, it doesn't really take much more than half an hour uh, for the skewers themselves. Um, for the cedar planks, they usually give at least an hour with some weight on it to make sure it goes down below. It prevents it from burning on the grill. Now you see how I'm putting these on here is I'm using two skewers because shrimp and most other seafood like this or lobster uh, curl up pretty bad when they're grilled and they're cooked. And so that way this helps prevent it. And not to mention if you are gonna be uh, you know, if you're a shrimp family, like mine is, and the other day we had probably about ooh, 30, 40 shrimp going up on the grill. I didn't want to spend the time and like flip over each of the shrimp. Right. So I put them all on skewers, much easier just to be able to take it, flip over like that and call it a day. I like it. Yes. Now. All about convenience. All about convenience, all about efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> Us Germans, yeah, very efficient. Yeah, boy. <laughs> all right. So two spices that I'm going to recommend uh, we have several out there in the market right now. Is uh, we're going to go with our Chicago steak seasoning that we're going to use for that our steak, which was included in everybody's packet package. Well, that was nice. Yeah. And the other one is going to be the classic barbecue. Now, the classic barbecue spice. I like to add this one to the shrimp. Um, 
it's uh, it's real, really like it takes you to a different level. All right, it, it gives, gives a nice little uh, like, nice little heat, a little sweetness because of the brown sugar heavy base to it. That's very common to like the Midwest uh, uh, spice mixes out here for barbecue and sauces. Now I noticed that you're not uh, just you know getting right on top of the shrimp with that. Yeah. You're just kind of sprinkling from a few inches above. Yes, uh, when you're when you're seasoning your your steak or protein, um, and especially if you're not not taking out of the shaker like this. Um, you know, some people, they, they, they just kind of spoon it on or they dump a container onto it, and it's really improper seasoning. Now, we're not going to get all fancy. We're not going to do the whole <laughs> salon seasoning thing on there. It's silly. Um, but we are going to make sure we have an even seasoning and coat on. Now, the shrimp was already marinated, so I don't need to oil it, but we are going to do that for our steak, and we'll do it like so. Now, oiling it, why yeah. are you not oiling the grill? Ah. Good question, Lauren. So, we're gonna make sure we get both sides of it. It's just a light coat, okay? It's not gonna be doused in it. Um, there's, uh, there's three benefits you're gonna have with uh, oily your proteins instead of your grill. Well, one, uh, that, that uh, oil is gonna help the seasoning to adhere to the steak. Two, it's gonna add to the uh, uh, conduction of the heat and it's gonna be able to get a better sear on it. And the three, that's gonna help prevent your sticking. Now, as far as uh, oiling your grill, um, I only recommend really doing it like at the beginning, before you even turn the grill on. If you're going to scrub it, if you're going to scrape it down, you should be doing it anyway. Uh, maybe take a paper towel, a little bit of oil, you can wipe up and get a little extra ash off it. If, if you want to. Well, well, yeah. I mean, that, that's what I would recommend. That's the way that I do it usually for my grill. Now, when it's hot, you know, this, it's not going to do you any good. It's something that's going to be flare ups. When you sit there with an aerosol spray can, you're going to you create yourself a little uh, flamethrower. Uh, it's going to just dissipate right off the grease before you even get on there. And if you try to just put the oil on it itself as well as too, it's going to be, it's going to be just, just way too hot. First of all, good chance you're burning yourself. And then it's, it's not going to really be as much of assistance as it would by doing it this way. Okay. Now, so, what kind of oil did you use here, Chef? What I used for this one was a um, blended oil. Uh, what that is is 75% uh, canola oil, 25% uh, or just olive oil. And the reason behind it. I'm going to say why. Flash points and high burn point. If you think about it, that heat coming that's off it is just heat from 500 degrees, it's internal cavity of it. It's that um, um, you want to make sure that you're going to have uh, oil that's going to have a high flash point. Extra virgin olive oil has a low flash point, low burn point, that it can also give an off putting flavor. So, we can recommend for other oils will be uh, soy oil, canola oil, uh, center vegetable, we're going with uh, sunflower. Uh, linseed oil, grapeseed oil, avocado oil, which is uh, really been, uh, coming out strong in the market. All that's fantastic for high flash points. Got it. So blended virgin, oil. Yeah, the extra virgin is more, but just add a little bit of flavor component to it, but still uh, avoiding the fact that it could burn quickly. Okay. So we put a light coating of oil on the grill, and now you're going to use on the, the I'm steak. sorry, on the steak. See, I was testing you to see if you were going to make sure I did it right. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Um, and you're putting the Chicago steak seasoning on the um, ribeye. Yep. Now, you know, one of the things I did want to ask about earlier, I mean, well, two things. One, I, I love this little tip right here that I'm going to share with everyone. Um, I used to season my steaks right on the countertop because I was like, what difference does it make? But then you wouldn't be able to do that really cool trick that you just did with all the extras that fall onto the plate if you're using a plate. The, the larger cut of meat that you have, the more, uh, uh, the more volume of meat and protein you have anyway. So you need to, you know, add a good amount of seasoning. I talking about like 10 ounce fillets or some center cut seven ounces, even around those lines. You want to make sure it gets seasoning all around it. Uh, but we start off at the top, with bottom, anything that falls over on the extra on the side of the plate or the tray platter itself, then you can actually just turn the steak on its side and make sure you get all that seasoning in there so you have no waste. Yeah. Um, Justin said he needs a bigger kitchen to wheel his grill inside. It's getting cold up there in the Northeast. Yeah. We agree. Sure is. Sure is. <laughs> Um, and also, I did have, yeah, we have this hood system. That's how come we get to grill inside. It actually allows for the air to be pulled up and uh, the the smoke. They the did. They do. Them. You know, we might have a guy. If you need a guy, let us know. We, I know a guy. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask, we are talking about steaks earlier, and I forgot to ask, this is a bone-in ribeye, right? So right. what's the benefit of me having a steak that has a bone in it versus not having a bone in it? Well, let's, uh, let's get it on. Okay. And then we'll touch that subject. How okay, that? sounds good. Now, because of the uh, the shrimps only take roughly about uh, three minutes per side, direct grilling, and the steak itself can be closer to about 12 to 15 minutes, um, we're going to get uh, get the steak going here first and make sure we're always going to choose ourselves a spot on the 
direct side. Direct heat. Direct heat, got it. Okay. All right, good deal. So you hear that sizzle right away? Yes. Okay. And because a lot of times for these classes, we get a little chatty. We're going to go ahead and set our, uh, set our time here for two minutes before we do a little rotation to get those beautiful hash marks everybody's trying to get, right? Right, because so, we're going Instagram worthy here. Instagram worthy. Absolutely. <laughs> So um, we're talking about the, uh, the bone in versus the bone less. All right. So yes. uh, bone in uh, steaks, whether it's going to be pork or it's going to be uh, filet, it's going to be um, uh, bone and strip steak or this one here, uh, the ribeye, is uh, you tend to actually get more flavor and, and, and juice your steak out of the product. So what's that doing is there's, uh, there's more fat that's going to be up, up around the bone and, and, and cut the tissue that's going to actually help uh, bleed some of the flavor and the juices into the rest of the steak. That's what typically you would, you know, that's where the bone comes into play. Um, uh, the the um, benefit as well too is going to be some of the look to it. If you're going to go for like a, a, like, like a bone side of it, it's going to be a little longer. I'm talking like a tomahawk style of it. Then you should want to wrap that uh, the bone as well into aluminum foil. I'm not sure if you have foil sheets attached to it, but included in yours or into the recipe. But if you did that, that's going to help uh, really just prevent that bone from being charred and, and burnt while you're grilling it because when you're paying for a pound price, you're paying for a pound price including that bone. So you actually want to show it off, especially with a smaller bone. So you're doing lamb chops, for example. Um, that is something that we do quite often here in the industry as well. <laughs> I got to tough it up. I'm in Buffalo. We grill uh, all winter long. Justin, uh, I heard there was also a comment here that said, uh, it's never too cold to grill. And then Karen asked, why direct heat? Direct heat for, uh, for steak, we're doing, the, we're doing the direct sear method. So that's why we're gonna go straight up direct sear first. So go over the direct heat right over the main flame. So we're getting that sear on there. Get that sear on there. Lock it, it does, in. Uh, yeah, it locks the juices in, it sears the, it sears the pores uh, to, to keep that steak nice and juicy. Um, uh, uh, the, co the colleagues out there in Buffalo, the other one who said it's never too, never too cold to grill. Absolutely, we stay in by 100%. Uh, Lauren and I have done events in, in the snow. To <laughs> to to hey, I got. I'm going to throw a loop there. It's Karen. What if I got a sear mechanism on my barbecue? That is a great thing to have. I'm going to put the stop on our timer. Hold on one second. We'll answer that because we had that question in our class yesterday as well. Look at those pretty marks. Okay. So we're going to move it still to direct, 90 degrees, and a different spot. Exactly. Got it. So we did two minutes, we're doing another two minutes? We'll do, we'll do a minute on it. A minute? You're yeah. going to make me like hold the camera and change the timer? No, you're going to do it by yourself. <laughs> so, so what was the question? So, so Karen just asked us that she's got actually the sear um, burner on her grill. Yeah. Remember we talked about this last night, so I'll let you answer because I don't remember exactly the answer. So same with the, uh, the individual was asking about their, their summit. The summit for sure has a sear, the sear burner as well. So you can use that. Uh, you set up your uh, your direct grilling now in the center. You take you have the sear grate on, you have the, uh, the sear burner on, there's also two burners next to it, and then you can have the outside of it is going to be off. So that way you can use that as your indirect. Uh, what, that, what that sear burner is, it has high BTU, um, where it's, it's, a, it's stronger and able to get, a, to get a really nice sear on it. So you can keep that on high as well. You can do it for approximately the same amount of time. Go two minutes on it. You saw the, you saw the marks around that. Yeah. These, the, these, those, these are the standard burners we have around the Genesis, and they were ample. The same thing would be uh, good for your sear burners as well. Okay, so I've got, um, what do you think about cast iron pan on the grill? And then um, I have an older summer uh, silver A grill, direct heat or medium, and then a summer a summit where all burners are the same. Well, you should still be able to turn um, your burners off and on on those grills, so you'll have the direct heat. Did you lose the tongue? No, I was hanging out there. I got, I got hooked everywhere. Yeah, right? So before we go and answer those questions, so we did 90 degrees. Now we're flipping it completely over and going to a new spot on the other side. Look at those marks. Oh my God, it's so pretty. Yay. Give me a real close up. Hopefully my phone won't catch on fire. And same thing with the, with the shrimp. Now we put those direct as well. Direct heat on shrimp. Got it. So we, now we have just seen, seen the uh, move it now from, from one spot on the grade, uh, the grills, uh, the grill grates to a new spot every time I flipped it or turned it. And the reason on is because we have, used up all the energy, all the heat from those particular grates. So you want to get to new spots and get the same, same beautiful, nice sear on it. 
and uh, and avoid um, and avoid like a cold grade as well. Right, because you want to get the the new energy from the new the yes. new the new grades. Right. So, okay, so just to, um, you should have your burners that are on on medium high. Yes. And if regardless of the grill that you have. If you want a direct zone, you just turn those burners on and the other burners off. I think that should handle everybody's answers to those questions, except for Ann, who asked about a cast iron uh, skillet on the grill. We love cast iron cooking. You know, in fact, a lot of our classes, we kind of design it around our cast iron uh, GPS system, which is a gourmet barbecue system, um, where we have a center, of the, like the center of, of the circle of the, of the gray weather charcoal, or there's a removable center circle uh, inside of the gas grate as well, so we have for Spirit, Genesis, and Summit, um, where you can actually put a cast iron wok, a cast iron griddle, uh, right in that center part. Um, the same would apply if you're using a normal cast iron griddle uh, that you would have at home. I got several myself because I love working with it in last generations, and once you take care of them. Um, now, I would typically, you know, if you want to just, if you want to just do like the sear, like on a steak with a cast iron, you don't have to do it on the grill. You could also just do that at home, you know, like right on your stove. Um, you can use that for, for doing like a more fajita style cooking. If you want to do that for baking cakes on there, if you want to do it for- I'm sorry, what did you just say? Baking cakes. You can bake a cake on a grill? You can bake cakes on grill. No, you cannot. Yes, you can. What? Yes. Oh. And that's going to be primarily <laughs> indirect. Um, that's awesome. But um, a, lot, a lot of uh, what people ask about too is uh, taking the cast iron pan and they use that to finish off their steaks. That's typically where you're going to impart some of the fresh aroma and herbs into the uh, steak itself. Do some fresh butter, a little crushed garlic, add some rosemary to it, and you're going to be uh, taking some of the melted goodness and just kind of finishing off in a napier, if they call it, as they lightly coat the steak with the additional uh, seasoning and, uh, and herbs. Okay, so our timer is going off again. So just to review, we had two minutes for the initial sear, 90 degrees, one minute. And then flipped it over to uh, the other side, and that was another two minutes. Yes, that was one minute, two minutes. Okay. So we have Ooh. we have the one sear side over there. You okay. can actually turn it a little bit here because the grapes are going to be hot. Okay. And the shrimp are going to do a rotation. Okay. You see, ready it went from gray to a more of a reddish color. Nice pink getting on there. Got a nice Ooh, yeah, that looks good. We're gonna take you know, kind of like a halfway point look at what the temperature is of our steak right now. And the reason behind it is want to see where you are in direct right now determine how long you want to stay going. Okay. So now when you come to your mom, a lot of people going straight down. A lot of times you're going right through the bottom say, wow, that's hot coming off. You're, you're measuring the temperature of heat coming off the grid. Oh yeah, no. you want to know what the meat is. Yeah. So you want to go with more from the from the angle, right into the center of the steak at some point there. We're at 97, 96 degrees. And we're going for medium rare, medium, yeah? yeah. You want to pull it off about 120. 120, okay. which is now, like what, is, a few degrees below what the actual temperature is. Right. Now this is this is by the bone, okay? This is not at the bone, but this is kind of next to the bone. Typically, looking to be a few degrees of lower temperature, look at this 88, 87 degrees, because that's kind of protecting it. We're not measuring it against the bone whatsoever. And that then tends to uh, conduct it to as well, and that'll give you a proper reading, where if you're gonna uh, do that, you're gonna have um, possibly a, a well-done steak or a steak that's a further longer than you actually want to have. Um, so when you're whenever you're taking the temperature of a ribeye, make sure you've got a bone in state. You want to go for the meatiest part of the steak away from the bone, uh, so we have more uniform uh, 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 cooking process all throughout it. Now, so beef simply about 97 degrees uh, for the main component there, the main center part of the meat. So now we want to go for about another three minutes um, between your cooking before we go ahead and check it again, which is also a good time for our uh, for our shrimp stewards to get moved in direct, we're going to check to see how they are moving. So Ann said that she has to admit that it's hard to get good heat when the temperature is, in, and she put the dingle digits, I think she meant the single digits, um, but her husband doesn't really care uh, for being, and her, her husband doesn't really care for being out there either. But Ann, this now means that you can be the grilling expert in the household and take over. And uh, that's, that's going to be one of the challenges we're talking about dealing with the elements outside. You know, if we're working on gas, propane does not like gold. Right. You know, but charcoal does. Yeah. Charcoal uh, is, um, you know, it's just like anything else. You add more fuel, how are going to get, right? Absolutely. And Cynthia, we thank you for joining us today. And we love the company and, uh, and, and the grilling, right? Everything's great here today.
So um, uh, as we're waiting out for this thing to, uh, to finish up. <laughs> she said, not a chance. I do all the inside stuff as described at the very beginning of the podcast. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't think it's his, I think it's just someone else who, uh, who agrees that the man should be doing the grind. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a 50-50 world out there these days, folks. Oh, my Anybody goodness. can be. Yes. Chris said, this is awesome. Learning lots of tips and tricks. Hopefully I won't screw this up for the wife later tonight. And then she's, uh, Cynthia also said that the initial story was great. She could definitely relate. Uh, we do all the prep and the girls said the guys take all the credit. Absolutely. Not at my household, but that's okay. <laughs> we, we mix up quite a bit as you can imagine. We do chef. It's like a lot of times I'm not even known for dinner. Right. So the wife's got to be cooking. Um, but uh, yeah, she, she, she's got no problem uh, getting, getting up on my grill as well too. And I let it. So it's a fair amount. That's so, nice to you. William. I, mean, I like you. <laughs> So I want to give you another great tip, okay? So we talked about, like, my preference is charcoal grilling because it's a smoke type of flavor that's out there. Um, this is this is an option for you guys to get the same type of smoke flavor as well as on your gas grill. By using one of these, uh, these smoker boxes, what you do is you can add some smoke chips to it. See? See, this is why we set the timer. All, all the whole thing tight storage takes away from We're chatty Cathy's over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's take a look at it. We want to make sure that we're not overlooking our steak, and I'll continue about using this. With wet smoke chips inside of it, you can put this directly on your breaker right above the burner, let it heat up and start smoking before you start continuing or start with grilling your steak. So you can impart some of that smoke flavor to it, all right? Christian, you are, we're hired right now. You're your virtual chef right now. <laughs> if you want to email some pictures, you have some questions, I'm sure we could uh, we'd set that up you for you. Awesome as well, too. If you guys are like grilling right now, send, send, send the photos out there. Yeah. I think even Steve said at the beginning, like if you're on your grill, if you're grilling, we'd love to see you guys and what you're doing too. So oh, those here, shrimp are looking like they're almost done, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we got the nice trail marks on here. We're looking over at the uh, center part, the media part of the shrimp. You don't see any more gray whatsoever. Also, we're going to be feeling it. It's going to feel firm, and you don't want to get too rubber on this one because that's what's going to happen with shrimp. We want to make sure you set it aside so you'd be uh, ready to have that uh, steak. Now, as far as your as far as the steak itself, let's go ahead and pull it up a little closer. And check the temperature check again. The temperature on it. You want to, again, you want to, um, you're looking for about 120 degrees. Okay. Ooh, 118. So close. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that for, for medium rare because you okay. can look at some other spots of the grill yeah. of the steak oh, yeah, itself. It's a little higher. It's going to be a little bit higher. Okay. okay. At this point, you want to pull it out and set it over here on a cutting board. Close it. Now, here's a little tip for you. Oh, there's another tip. I'm yeah. going to be able to hear you. Yeah, for there cleaning you. your grills, when you're done grilling right now, what you do is you turn everything, everything on high. Save your timer for about 10 minutes. Just like I'm going to do here again. Okay. And then when that's done, all you do is go on there. You kind of scrape everything as you kind of turn it ash, everything left over residue for it, and then you can screw it all your burners off. Don't forget to turn your gas off as well, too. So, again, to avoid any uh, thermal events. Now, with the charcoal grilling, you know, um, it's going to be the same thing we're going to be doing. We're going to be your, 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 you set everything on the direct grilling, be right over the coals, and directly be off the coals. You know, if by chance you need to do a little rotation around, to, to you're maybe going left and right, so you want to rotate uh, around closer to the coals or to the main source, you can do that as well. But we're going to go ahead and take a look at our steak here in about a minute or two. So you're letting the steak rest, right? Yes, absolutely. So and what, why do we let our steak rest, Jeff? We got to think about it. all the blood and all the juices inside the steak have been like boiling inside of it. It's going to get to you know, it's as high it's a, a temperature as we kind of get a little high juices. You were slice into it right away after you uh, pull it off the grill. It's going to just kind of bleed out on you. And also, your temperature had gone from a perfect medium rare up to medium, medium well. So you want to leave, leave uh, just let it rest five to ten minutes. You can tent it. Not on the grill, but more on a plate or on the side for about five, ten minutes with a little bit of foil on top of it. So it's going to cook on the outside as well. Gives you enough time to get all the you know, sides together and maybe pour that extra glass of wine. I mean, I think that's, you know, that makes sense. Right, go to beer, get a glass of wine, uh, corral the kids, get the chitlins going so they can sit down as well, too. Make sure the dog has their food as well because they're going to be there begging for that bone. <laughs> and uh, they'll be ready to sit down and eat. My biggest pet peeve is when I'm all ready to go. Steaks are good. Where is everybody? You know, <laughs> I'm sitting there going, I'm, you know, I want to wait for you, but I'm not going to wait because my steak is ready. It's ready. Right, right. We don't want it to overcook. Right. All right. Um, and
any questions that you guys have now would be a good time to kind of uh, ask them. Karen said, wine check, dog check. Yep. <laughs> so I love it. How many times? Oh, there's one dog. So <laughs> how many times do I turn the steak? You went back and forth on either side of your grill. How many times? Um, so the, uh, so we have the initial place on the grill. Okay. After about two minutes, we did 90 degree rotation and then we flipped it once over we flipped it once over. Every time we, we turned it 90 degrees or it flipped it over, we went to a new hot spot on the grill. And then we went uh, to indirect. We just rotated uh, and uh, put it in the indirect side of it. So you only flip it once, but you're rotating twice. Got it? Uh, I don't, but I think my grill master does. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the more you handle the steak, the more you're rotating it or flipping it around, a more chance of it actually being closer to, to a medium well, well done and higher temps. Oh. Same thing. Same thing applies for doing burgers. A lot of people are they're playing around with it too much, or flipping around too much. Um, it's just like we talk about the lid clothes. Because if you're looking, you're not cooking. Thank you. <laughs> very important. You know, I got to trust some of those cook times. You have to let yourself go. Go by the, some of the recipes that are out there. And trust that even that white smoke coming off, it's good stuff. If it's going to be dark billet smoke coming out of your grill, yeah, you might want to check it. Right. <laughs> Eric said his wife likes well done, <laughs> no red. Well, that's the good thing about this is that that searing technique that we showed you will actually allow for you to get the sear marks on it and then move it to, to direct, or sorry, to indirect, and then cook it all the way through so that there is no red without losing a lot of the juices. Um, Aaron asks, when using the smoker box, do you suggest cooking the meat the same way or slower with lower heat? Um, no, um, because it because you're not gonna um, because of the size of the regular steak, uh, I would go with the same way with it. You just you're just gonna during that cooking process during the searing process, you're still gonna impart that smoke flavor. You go on the lower temperature up on the grill, you're not gonna get the same type of sear as well. Um, if you do uh, on the reverse sear steak up the reverse sear of it, that's where it's gonna be lower temperature. That'll work. But remember, you can't. Go put your steak down the grill and so you start seeing that smoke coming out of the box. Okay. And Eric asked what temperature is well done. It's 160. 165 uh, and above. And above, yep. 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 So it's not moving anymore, right? No, no red. Yeah. But for our purposes, what we're looking for was that delicious, medium warm rare. Warm red center. Warm red center. <gasps> that looks perfect. Oh my goodness. No. Lauren, some of the other questions we got from our clients before with our virtual classes is, Chef Lauren, um, do you get to eat these uh, steaks and dinners uh, every Yeah, time? we do. I'm starving right now. I haven't eaten anything all day. <laughs> yes, Job <we> perks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then David says, is it possible to grill without drinking a beer? And I, I said, and then Ann said, no, it's a cardinal rule. And then what, uh, what whiskey do you recommend to go with this steak? <laughs> um, Yes, it's possible just because you could, we're bound. We're bound. We're kind of, we're kind of running a job right here. <laughs> right. We don't get to drink. <laughs> I actually, we will we both actually have another class coming up here this afternoon. So, <laughs> you know, we got to make sure we keep our heads that even keel. Although what it would, would, would add some fun to it. Um, um, but I do prefer uh, with it. All of right. Course. So as far as the, um, the, the whiskey that can go with this one here, it's like, a, you know, I'm a bourbon guy, you know, so if you want to get into a, one of the local ones out here, Kabbalah says a really good bourbon out Chicago there. Chicago one, yeah. Yeah, Chicago one. Uh, our Maker's Mark has always been one class about it. Not Creek is a big fan of yeah, mine. Yeah, there's one up in uh, DeKalb that... Uh, Buffalo Trace. What was the other What was it called? I wanted to say... Well, I was going to say Whistle Pig is one Whiskey of my Whiskey Acres. Like. Whiskey Acres is the one. Whiskey Acres question, Lauren. Okay. A lot of videos talk about not using a grill brush, but half an onion. Can you weigh in on that? Want it on that one? No, no, all you, sir. You're the grilling expert. I'm just the sidekick. What, what that what that onion is doing is releasing some of the uh, the acidity and the, and, and, and some and some like sulfur and stuff like it's in the, in the onions itself to help kind of uh, get some of the, the grates clean. But but I, I don't see really how an onion is going to help it if you got a big chunk that's just kind of burnt or stuck on there. That's where you're still going to need a grill brush. The main thing you have to watch out for. This is obviously another another Weber uh, three-sided uh, grill brush here. Is that um, after a certain amount of time, you need to replace this as well too, because you have to watch out about the little wire uh, pieces coming loose and breaking off. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Um, and after my grill brushing, then you can always take a little oil in your onion and you can wipe it off from there if you want. 
Um, you're leaving one of the most popular grills uh, out, out, the, uh, out there right now, a pellet grill. I know Weber has one and maybe coming out with a new model. Thoughts about not using charcoal or propane and using a pellet grill or smoker? I, did you hear something on the inside? <laughs> that, uh, Do you know somebody, Aaron? You know, you know something? <laughs> so, so let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about the smoke fire. Then. Okay, smoke fire is Weber's pellet grill came out last November. We have two sizes. We've got a 24 inch and a 36 inch, and they are absolutely awesome. Okay, um, despite that, it's, uh, maybe some of the comments about the uh, the pellets have difficulty getting it in. That's been solved. That's been taken care of. We have an additional um, um, a chute that gets added into your back. Uh, back surge capacity. We don't have one out here. I do have one on my back patio for the Grill Academy. Um, it is digital. It is wonderful. The Weber Connect is already 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 in, inside of it, part of it. So you have to do is just uh, download the app, um, you have to connect directly to your phone. And uh, let's say we're going to do some smoking first, and then we're going to finish off a high grill. So for example, uh, here at the restaurant, we have a smoke and grill pork chops. So we do have a, a brine whole pork loin. Uh, seasoned barbecue spice. We set our we set our uh, pellet grill to about uh, 275. Um, all electric. All it is is just fired up by a little uh, little burn pot where the flame is. The auger releases the uh, the flavored pellets right into it. Gets it going. It lets me know when the grill is ready. I pop it in. The smoke is going because it's a low temperature. Uh, it keeps on adding more wood to it and, and it really imparts that smoke flavor. And I let that go for about 45 minutes maximum. And then I'll pull out my pork loin, hit the switch for the thermometer, crank it up to possibly 500 degrees, and it takes roughly about 10 minutes to get that hot. And in the meantime, I'll cut out my pork chops, and my barbecue sauce ready, a little additional pork spice, or a barbecue spice, pop it right on the grill, sear it off, glaze it, and we're good to go. So Justin said, I love my pellet grill. I still have a propane for some stuff, but pellet is great for baking stuff like pizza too. And David actually said it's getting smoky in the background, which is a great point because we actually cranked the grill up. That's what that last timer was, was so that we could burn off all that extra stuff. We're all the way past 500 at this point. Six, six, yeah. Right so that's what we're doing. We're getting those grates nice and smoky mm -hmm. so that we can just brush off the excess stuff that's on there. Thank goodness we have this hood system inside. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> the Weber grill. If you come into the restaurant, you don't expect to smell charcoal or smoke. I know. I, I mean, I have to say that I've had definitely my guy friends are like, you always smell so great, Laura. <laughs> like, thanks. My dog loves it. My dog loves it when I get home. <laughs> so that's it. And now we're clean and ready to go for the next time that we grill. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, guys. I think it's time. I mean, this steak is calling my name. I don't know about your guys' Steaks that you have at home waiting to get on the grill if you haven't gotten them already there but this looks like a really good feast to me so i think we're gonna uh turn it back over to um i don't know if karen you're taking control or whatever i know we have a raffle that you yeah, guys are gonna I'm do right here. awesome okay karen so we'll turn it over to you and you guys can do the raffle and um you know if you guys have any questions feel free them to email them to um i think who um oh my goodness was it Kim, our, Kim, our, um, our, yep, you can uh, email him to, yep, I'm the one that keeps bothering everybody, so they can email me. <laughs> and then we'll answer those for you if you have any additional questions, but we're so honored to have had you guys join us today, and we hope that you enjoy your, your steaks, and, uh, Chef Klaus? Yeah, uh, Klaus and Laura signing off here from Harvard Grill. Thank you very much. You guys keep grilling. We love you. Keep on going. And, uh, again, four season grilling, right? Yes. Absolutely. All year round. Yep. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Okay, thank you everybody very much. That was very entertaining. I know we, we absolutely learned a lot of hints and tips. For anybody out there who uh, didn't catch everything, we did record the session. So if you want to get a copy of that, reach out to your Advisex folks and get a copy of that from them so that you, know, you can maybe watch it on your own. <laughs> it's a little bit slower. I know I would have needed that. Uh, so what we wanna do is we wanna do a little bit of a draw uh, to give away a prize. And Lucy Tetz, I believe you're out there. Would you like to explain what the prize is? Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, hope you can hear me. So we have two, uh, two prizes. Um, the first prize is a Weber grill. And um, a, you have a choice, either a charcoal Weber grill or a um, gas Weber grill. 
So we're going to pick a number between 1 and 20. So I want Steve Cooker to actually pick the number. And we will coincide it with, um, I did a little spin of the wheel, and we'll coincide it with the winner. So um, Steve, you want to pick a number from 1 to 20 to win the uh, grill? Okay, sure. 23. <laughs> okay. <I'm so> 20. <laughs> 20, 20 that's, a, that's 20 in Canadian, Steve. We 23, is, 23 is my number, I think. So I'm picking 23. Okay, how about uh, it's always lucky seven? Seven. Lucky seven. All right. Lucky seven actually is Adam Winter. Woo! Put your hands hey, up. Hey. Adam Winter. Woo! Woo! Adam Winter from this. Uh, Department of Transportation, State of Massachusetts. All right. All right, Adam. Woo. All right. Now we're going to pick a number from 20 to 36 to win the set of weather grilling tools. So pick a number. Don't say 10, Steve. 11. <laughs> That's me. How about number, uh, you know what, you know, it was funny. I said number 23, but then people will think I'm fixing things. So you said 20 to 36. How about 33? 33. Do we have a John Unser? All right. Woo! All right. Woo! Woo! All right. So um, Adam, will um, Kim will reach out to you and see which uh, grill you would like, either the charcoal or the, um, or the gas grill. And uh, we'll send out these, uh, these great, fabulous prizes to all you, to both of you, sorry. So thank you everybody for attending. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions from the presentation, please reach out to Advisix. And thank you to Advisix for hosting it and my fellow presenter, Kyle Todd. Have a great evening and enjoy those steaks. Thanks all. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining.